there's no one universal definition, Tom, about what is this information, certainly not in the European Union, because this information in itself exactly can be misinformation, it can be fake news, it can be actually a factual information just put in a wrong context, or it can be quoting the part of a factual information uh, and, uh, and uh, connected with misinterpretation. So, and this is why we in the European Union, because we are also uh, engaged in uh, fighting and combating this information, we are actually never engaging in this academic exercise of really defining whether this is disinformation or misinformation. We say we use the broad term disinformation. This is basically everything that uh, is uh uh, that is uh, covered as information that leads the reader, the, 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 the listener or the viewer to some kind of wrong conclusion that wants to mislead the, the, the audience. So for us, this, we use the term disinformation quite freely and it's not about really the pure academic uh, definition. It's about trying to differentiate what is the real news and what is the information uh, with the aim to mislead people and to bring a wrong narrative or wrong information from our point of view. A, a great question and it sounds super simple, but it's actually kind of loaded. Uh, I'll start with just quickly making sure everyone knows the difference between mis and disinformation. Uh, because misinformation is perhaps a little bit trickier because it's that's information that's incorrect. It's spreading uh, often with people intending not to spread wrong information. It's just they don't know. Disinformation is where you are intentionally spreading incorrect information for a myriad of purposes. And that could be for political purposes. It could be because you're trying to make money. It could be to defame someone. Uh, the why is slightly less important than the fact that it is intentional. And it is obviously kind of hard to prove intent in a lot of these situations, which is where you get into questions like what Tom is raising, who gets to decide what it is. Um, I think almost every single answer I'm gonna give today probably will touch in some way on the theme of interconnected responsibility. And there really is no silver bullet, right? Like there's no situation in which a government is going to be able to dictate everything on the internet as being right or wrong. <laughs> that would be profoundly undemocratic. Likewise, industry certainly has a role in trying to set standards, be clear about their own standards and approaches, what is acceptable on their platform and not. As private companies, they get to make those choices. They're not governments. And as individuals, our own responsibility in engaging with our family members and our friends and our communities, as well as being capable ourselves of asking questions and, and looking at the internet with, uh, with some clear eyes. And so I would take that entire frame and throw it back on the question, who decides what disinformation is? All of those actors collaboratively. I think it's pretty easy when we're talking about things like, is the earth flat? Factually speaking, we know that it is not flat and therefore anyone trying to spread information online suggesting that the earth is flat, obviously is spreading disinformation. I don't think that's controversial. Where we start getting into trickier areas is where there's greater debate around fact or where we're communicating opinion. Or I think we'll get into some questions later about you know where we're talking about things like propaganda or, or foreign interference, that sometimes that can take on a little bit of a twinge that's harder to define exactly a line of fact or fiction. Uh, and that's where we really have to be actively involved as a democratic society in deciding how we engage in a digital space. Yongling, you are absolutely right because uh, there are many state actors involved and engaged in these information activities. There are also non-state actors, but uh, one of the state actors, of course, it's Russia. We know it very well, especially since the start of Russia's aggression against Ukraine and Ukrainian people. Uh, Russia basically unleashed uh, without any reservations and without any limits. Also, it's disinformation campaigns, misinformation campaigns and propaganda, which are accompanying the, the real uh, military operations and the military military aggression. So yes, Russia as a state actor is very, very involved, very much involved in this information. And they are also uh, creating an ecosystem of all the possible outlets and disinformation actors who are then spreading the disinformation on their behalf, helping them to reinforce the effect of this malicious information warfare, so to speak, because European Union recognizes disinformation as one of the hybrid threats and hybrid weapons actually to be to be used against the European Union. So yes, Russia as a state actor is very much engaged in this information, but it's not the only one. There are also other state actors and there are many, many non-state actors. Yeah, he's actually getting at, you know, one of the points I made earlier, which is that as individuals, we also have to learn how to engage in a digital space uh, 
I don't want to say suspiciously, but you know, trust but verify is a really useful frame of, of looking at and asking questions about you know, who posted something, why might they have posted it, does this seem slightly off, is this a trusted source? Um, what gets tricky when we're starting to talk about quote unquote propaganda or just in general, the question of how foreign governments may be trying to influence uh, our own democracies from uh, abroad is that it doesn't always look super heavy handed. It's not like Russia showing up in the US information space or a European country's information space and saying, I'm Russia and you're terrible and I'm great. That would be really easy, <laughs> both to confront and to frankly ignore. Uh, what has become much more sophisticated in how different countries are leveraging the information environment is that they find fissures within society that are then already part of the digital debate. It's already the things that people are having conflict and confrontation about online and frankly in their own political spaces. And they try and find within those communities, those fissures, and they'll either uh, represent themselves as members of those communities uh, in trying to stoke division, uh, or just as the country that they are, as actors that they are, really try and throw a good whataboutism card, you know, saying, well, you know, who are you to talk about democracy when you treat people from minority communities in your country so terribly? Or who are you to talk about this when you are so bad at why? Um, it can take a lot of different forms. And the more it is tied to domestic politics, the harder it is both to identify as propaganda and frankly to confront because then it's become part of a genuine democratic debate that citizens have to have in a country. Uh, and you don't know the ways in which it's been poisoned. And so, you know, in those spaces, in addition to being um, paying, you know, an active listener and uh, active questioner online, it's also really important, frankly, that we have uh, real conversations and that we work within our own communities to address those fissures because a resilient society is a society that is going to be harder for a foreign government to push their propaganda in and to mess with the digital ecosystem. The more fractured and divided a society is and the fewer places there are for those important hard conversations, the easier it is to stoke up division. And that's often one of the main intentions behind propaganda these days. But a reminder that propaganda itself, you know, age old uh, technique and always has a purpose uh, and so being conscious of why a foreign government might be involving itself in your digital world is also smart. Thank you, Meg. Indeed, I mean, you are partially right. There is a big role and big responsibility for social platforms and social media. And this is why the European Commission is actually engaging with them, uh, asking them or engaging with them to, to enter or to join the so-called code of conduct, where the social platforms and the big tech companies are actually subscribing to certain code, which uh, when they implement means that they are taking down the malicious content, the disinformation, that they are preventing the spread of disinformation or misinformation. So the social platforms are already doing a lot by themselves or based on the code of conduct and cooperation with us. But yes, it is also true that they still could do more. And this is why we keep engaging with them because they have a huge role to play and huge responsibility in terms of preventing the spread of disinformation. There's absolutely a uh, critique that should be placed at the feet of industry, as well as of government, as well as broader society uh, and, and a number of other places. Um, I think what you saw is that people tend to not take things seriously. Often what becomes deeply dangerous communities and trends and narratives either appear so ridiculous that people kind of dismiss them, or they appear so fringe that they exist in a space people aren't paying attention to, that by the time they hit the mainstream or they combine with other communities that you are more familiar with, it's a little too late. Um, and so, I, you know, should there be blame uh, with industry for not acting fast enough? Absolutely. Uh, in terms of moving forward, I think the lessons learned there is that these are cross-platform and that's part of why, you know, if, if one platform acts, people can pop up in another space. And we saw certainly, I, I assume Meg is referring to the QAnon phenomenon that then turned into a stop the steal movement that then turned into the basis for the January 6th insurrection. A lot of the organizing and mobilizing that extremist groups did using those networks. Um, and I think those are great case studies to look at because within that, that also required 
uh, frankly, local governments actually taking seriously real threats of violence from real organizing of real groups and people on the ground, in addition to these communities organizing in online spaces. Um, how the media was was or was not able to report on these things. How are they paying attention to it? Do we have local media? Again, I think we'll probably talk a little bit more about some of those aspects. Um, but industry certainly has a role to play and whether or not they put resourcing towards a problem, whether or not they work collaboratively and openly with civil society and with government so that we all have an understanding of what's happening in a multi-platform online space certainly has an impact on whether or not as society we're able to be resilient in defending and extending our democracy. Jim, you are right that uh, it is very important for every one of us to play our role actually in uh, treating the information carefully. And it's not so much about the traditional media versus uh, alternative media or independent media. Actually, independent media are good because they, they are supposed to be independent from the government and from other actors. But the so-called alternative media, which are thriving basically uh, based on the mistrust to the traditional media, they are the problem. Um, but overall, for us, again, in Brussels, in the European Union, we are saying that the best way to deal with disinformation as a challenge is uh, twofold. One is raising the awareness. This is what we try to do, basically making uh, the public uh, aware that disinformation is around and debunking the disinformation, exposing the disinformation actors. We do it via the website www.eu versus disinfo.eu. And the second leg of this uh, fight against uh, disinformation is um, the information literacy. That means we need to start right from the school age of kids to learn and to teach them how to work with information, how to work with information sources so that each one of us is able to distinguish this information, to see if the information which you are reading is credible, if there is clear source, if it's double sourced. Uh, it's important for us uh, to be able to double check the information or the triple check the information to rely on outlet which has a track record of being a credible information provider. So yes, information literacy and awareness raising are two most important ways how to deal with this information and it starts right with us as individuals and with states and institutions in each of the member states of the I think I should have just had Jim respond to one of the prior questions for us but he's defining uh, digital literacy in, in the modern era, that those are all extremely important practices that we all take forward, not just in looking at traditional media, but frankly, everything that you read online, particularly if something that you read gives you an emotional reaction, good or bad, that, that that's usually a little thing that your spidey sense should say, let's, let's look a little more closely at this. Um, but I think the other thing that he's alluding to and doesn't say outright is that there is right now a deep distrust in institutions and kind of a loss of faith in expertise itself. And that is dangerous as well, right? There's a little bit of a, a nihilist bent that is, is cutting through our politics and moves into then every other part of how we assess information and try and get a sense of where we think we sit in society. Um, and it's important to understand that that's not just accidental, that there have been uh, very strong political forces, whether you're looking at how Putin himself has organized his foreign policy and domestic policy to try and suggest to people that there's nothing worth believing in, that there's no one who's possibly good, and therefore there's kind of no truth. Everything goes. And you saw that, at least in the United States, kind of get replicated in the 2016 campaign. Uh, it usually follows with someone saying, like, I'm not that good. I'm not saying I'm that good. But everyone else who says they're good, they're full of crap. So, you know, at least with me, you know what you get. And then that tends to tie back into those experts, those institutions, those things that for years and years and years and years, you were told to trust, you were told cared about you or had your best interests at heart. How can you believe that? They failed you. And in those instances, all you have to do is find one example in which one of those institutions or individuals uh, wasn't completely right or completely honest uh, one human fault moment and the argument carries. And I think you're seeing that much smaller kind of tactic spreading across our institutions, spreading across our societies. And so it becomes increasingly important as individuals that we make sure the, the way that we approach questioning the media and the way that we approach questioning the information that's put in front of us isn't just feeding into that nihilism. It is actually intended to help us assess 
Why am I receiving what I'm receiving? Why is the individual or the institution that's putting this forward, putting it forward? Is it a credible source? Not to get us back into this unending cycle of distrust, uh, because at a certain point, we have to figure out who we trust. And what we are seeing as that reader uh, asking a question alluded to is that it will get filled. And if it means that we trust the guy that seems trustworthy on the internet who has a podcast or a YouTube channel that I like, or it's my neighbor or whoever else it is, we will replace the trust that we used to have in an institution with the people that are closest to us or with other informal institutions. And that's where uh, I think sometimes the, the dangerous impulse to say independent media, whatever it is, must be better than the standard media. It's an understandable impulse. And if we approach understanding why people have gotten there uh, and try and train ourselves to be thoughtful and questioning, trying to get back to shared understanding, uh, that that gets us a better path back. Um, but I think the question itself points out one of the hardest parts of this, right? What is, what is trustworthy and who gets to decide what's trustworthy? Jeremy, you are touching upon a very important issue, and that's uh, the issue of, of media pluralism. But I don't see media pluralism as a problem. I see the problem that uh, media might be used or misused by the disinformation actors. So I don't see the ownership of media as the biggest problem, because even if you say that 80% of the media are owned by a small group of people, uh, then you have still the remaining 20%. And it's up to you as a reader, as a critical reader, to find the media which you find independent, that has a track record and the necessary credibility. So then we go again back to ourselves, how we are able to deal with information sources, the, the issue of media literacy, what is my school teaching me, what is my country, what are the authorities of my country providing for the population to be aware of the disinformation and of the problem. So the ownership of the media or the media plurality, I don't think this is the biggest problem because I think it's healthy for democratic societies to have big plurality of the media so that people can choose. But it's important that they make informed choices, that they have a choice of an independent media which provides verified information and is not engaged in disinformation on one hand. On the other hand, it's important that we as readers, viewers or listeners are able to distinguish what is misinformation, what is disinformation, what is manipulation because uh, some media owned by specific people or companies or, or subjects might have specific agenda, not necessarily disinformation. They might have political agenda, they might have economic agenda. So, I mean, this is all legitimate as long as they, as they acknowledge it or as uh, long as it's uh, clear and you can track down this information and the ownership. But the problem with disinformation actors is that very often you cannot track down uh, to whom it belongs, who is running it. The journalists, the so-called journalists are hiding um, behind pseudonyms or fake names. So this is, this is the real problem. Uh, not really the media ownership by, by uh, multinationals or by rich people, but by the fact that there are outlets there who are really trying to mislead people and we need to be aware about it and we need to be able to distinguish who does what and why. One of the most important things, as we alluded to in the last question, that you can do to build resilience and trust in a society is local reporting and local sources. And we've seen in a lot of countries, the UK is one, the United States, certainly elsewhere, the erosion of local independent investigative journalism. The absence of that sort of infrastructure has had serious ramifications for our democracy around the world, because without people focused on understanding what's going on in our own communities, it's hard for us to be politically involved in our own communities and to make decisions in our own backyards. And at the end of the day, as much as national politics matter, uh, in the United States, there's a famous saying, all politics is local. And I think that's true everywhere. Uh, but you know, for accountability and, and accountable democracy to be possible, certainly we need to have the light of investigative journalism and the light of local journalism, and that is getting harder and harder. Uh, and I think there's a lot of conversations we need to have about why that is. Certainly the question of business models, certainly the question of the impact of social media platforms on the digital ecosystem and the way that we expected uh, our local media to operate, uh, as well as what was alluded to by the question, which has to do with consolidation of ownership under a select few in a lot of different countries. Uh, and I think that is something we should all keep a very close eye on. And I, I can't possibly overstate how dangerous that consolidation and the collapse of local journalism is.